Thank you for joining me on the Sutherland Report here, live from the UK. One of the incredible privileges I have, as I always say, is to bring on another amazing guest. And that is what I'm about to do now. I'm about to bring on Sheila Holm all the way from the United States of America, as we say over here, across the pond for an interesting discussion for an hour. Sheila, thank you so much for joining me today. We have managed, we have managed to work out our schedules and make it happen. So thank you for that blessing. It, it is a true blessing. It's, it's great to be on with you. No, not at all. Sheila, there is so much we can talk about. There is so much going on. And I want to focus on the United States of America, your backyard, even though I'm fully aware that you have had an amazing globe tropping experience where God takes you. So could you explain who you are, what's your background, what you do, what you get up to and where people can find you immediately from the off? Well, I, I can do that. I'll give some of the connect the dots because absolutely everything that I've been through in my life, all the experiences, especially the heavy duty ones of uh, trying to be taken out, uh, have led me to this point. And it helps me connect the dots for people. And it was uh, a big global travel with the father um, all to all the different continents. I've not been on South America's continent, but pretty much everywhere else. Uh, and it was all done on his dime. I'm still living on his dime. Uh, used to be a human resources director after uh, obtaining a couple of degrees uh, from college. And uh, in that, found out there was a lot of fraud and work comp, started a corporation for medical legal evaluation. That led to putting three superior court judges and a top trial attorney in prison on federal RICO racketeering charges. That changed my life a little bit. And so when all of that happened, I did not know that nobody in America had ever put a judge in prison or even in jail overnight. And um, I did not know that, that that was a new thing. I did not know um, what I was up against. And um, being a farmer's daughter from Nebraska and having all this travel with the father and the father bringing me through this was just, it was such a miraculous, miraculous time in my life. And then the agents kept changing my ID during the court process. And then I was dealing with identity theft every time they changed my numbers. And so I have the experience with all of that that's in my nation restoration book. And uh, but now there's 18 books because all of the experiences have given me the examples to help us understand, because I kept saying, God, I'm not a Bible scholar. You can't do anything with me. And he said, did I not? I'm not not walking with you as I walked with them. And you know how people keep wanting to say, well, Sheila, it's a little different than what God described in the Bible. Well, you don't have the whole story of that person. You only have a little bit of his story. Um, and which is all of our history, capital H-I-S, small T-O-R-Y, all of it has been developed for us to be ready for such a time as this. And this is the most unique time in all of history to take on the level of evil that we are taking on. It goes all the way back to the garden, the civil war in America. All they wanted to do was kill, kill believers. That's all they wanted to do since the garden, and we didn't get it. We've had a pandemic every 20 years and every century. But we didn't get 2020 was going to be the ultimate genocide. We don't think advance. We don't stay in touch with the father. We're not directed by him. And that puts us in a big mess because you, we use human wisdom. We lean on man's understanding. And that is not where we're to be. And that's why for all these years, my main comment, and now so many have given me gifts. If I, if I flip the camera around and showed you all the gifts in the office that say it's a faith walk, get tight with the father. Uh, because my first book, my testimony is it's a faith walk. And every time I do interviews, I keep reminding people, you have to get tight with the father. It's the only way through a storm. It is the only way. They keep saying in America, we don't experience any miracles or signs and wonders. And there's nothing happening for us. It's because we stop before we get through the storm. There's a wonderful, wonderful picture, and I can give it to you, share with the people. I've shared it out on Twitter, and they'd find it on my Twitter account. Uh, it's a picture of a bison coming through a snowstorm, and he's completely covered with snow but, they, snow, but they don't stop. They keep on going through the storm. Why? That's how you get to the other side, and the miracles are on the other side of the storm. So don't quit. Don't give up. We're coming through this. We're going to get through this, and don't 
agree or align with any of the declarations of the enemy because the power and authority in us is what's going to get us through this. That's the power and authority. When Christ is in us, we don't need revival. We just need to help restore each other, remain encouraged because the truth is God always wins. Man's plans fail and only God's plans remain and stand and are successful. Sheila, your, your story, your testimony and your life, it is, it is incredible. And then to hear what you have just said is so, is so encouraging. What do you, what do you think the spiritual health is? And maybe it's a huge question, maybe slightly unfair, but what do you think the spiritual health of America is at the moment? We're a little bit like Sodom and Gomorrah. We're a little bit like Nineveh. The reason why uh, Jonah was sent was because they were so mean to the Native American Indians and the First Peoples of Canada and all the 10 tribes that they say were lost. But if you look between Jonah doing that and 100 years later, Nahum sent back with the demand, that's it. Your time is up. Here you go. And God, God declared it to the king that you will not know where they went. You will not know. That's why they've been called the lost tribes ever since. They came to America. So America has been a very, very unique nation. But the same 45 points that they've used to destroy every nation globally was done in America. They've been, again, killing believers from the very beginning. That was the whole focus of the Civil War. We've never been independent. A lot of Americans don't know. We've been completely bankrupt since 1789, beholden unto the Bank of England, then beholden unto the International Monetary Fund. We've never lived in freedom and liberty. We've never been out of being enslaved. We are a servitude unto the people who are not kings or monarchs in our country, but they tried to do it. And that's why they took out President Jefferson, President Adams on our 50th anniversary of 1776 and 1826. Then Monroe said, you got to stop allowing this. The pilgrims told us in four pillars of the faith monument. And, uh, and someday we can, if you want to do the faith monument versus the soldier monument, it proves that they knew by the time of the civil war, liberty and freedom was not available. Tyranny had fully encompassed us and, uh, and planted itself everywhere on the land. And so by the time that that happened, the pilgrims banned, and this is the key, they banned the worship that's called Christianity, but Christ never did it while he was on the planet. They knew it because the Bible had just been translated into English. They knew that the Native Americans in America were the lost tribes of Israel because it was in the Apocrypha and the 1611 King James, that, that famous king. And uh, then they ripped it out in 1804 by the British and Foreign Bible Society. And in 1804 is when they started moving them out of their estates, uh, out of their homes. They had wooden homes just like everybody else. They had two and three story homes for the chief. And the mansions were identical to the mansions given to the territorial governors and to the governors of the individual colonies and then the states. We did not know that we've been taken over from the very, very beginning. So to look at what it is to be an American, to look at what it is to be free on the land, the pilgrims really tried, but there is no way. They banned Christianity in America. It's called Christianity, but it has nothing to do with Christ. It's pagan and, and um, it's got occultism. It's got witchcraft. It's got uh, spiritualism. It's got, uh, it takes you back to being a Gentile. So if you look up Jonah, and you look up what happened to Nahum 100 years later, and God said, where I have taken them, you will never know. And they worked diligently to find out, and that's what they did. So the root of this is stop doing the pagan feasts and festivals that are operated in the churches. Read Jeremiah 10 about the Christ, or the Christmas tree. And people stop after they go, you know, don't ornament a tree with silver and gold. Don't, don't put wood under it to, to make it appear to stand on its own. Don't, don't do these things because they're worshiping nature. That's where the Georgia Guidestones was. Don't be a cancer to the earth, you crazy people who believe in the Lord. Make room for nature. Make room for nature. Um, that's evergreen. Hillary. I, all of this relates. We had no idea how severe this would be. 
But the Pilgrim is banned it. It stayed out of most areas in America until 1870. In 1870, President um, Ulysses S. Grant, who was the last president of the Republic, he was in for two terms. And in 1870, he brought back Christmas. In 1873, he brought back Ishtar, which is a fertility goddess that will sacrifice children. And um, they do bloodletting rituals. And then they use the blood to dye the eggs that are fertility <laughs> ritual pieces. So you want to dress them up, make them look the best, bring the best children in so that your children will be burned and sacrificed after the bloodletting ceremonies. And you do that. Why? Because you want to have better crops. It's Moloch. It's Baal. It's Ishtar. It's all these gods and goddesses. And we're not to even deal with them or be aligned with them or be involved with them. And yet they call it Christianity. So that's the root of all of it. So anyone who has any questions on any of that, all you have to do is look up in scripture. And if you continue on Jeremiah 10, you'll be shocked what Father says. And when he said um, in Hosea, it's either 4, 6 or 6, 4, uh, where he said, um, my people perish for the lack of understanding, knowledge. lack of knowledge. People don't read the rest of it. He's not only going to reject us, he's going to reject our under the third and fourth generation. That's where we are because we've rejected his knowledge and we've lived with man's knowledge and we think we're not part of the other kingdom, but we're completely merged in it. I hear you, Sheila. I hear you very, very loudly. I hear you very, very loudly. You mentioned, I think, well, a number, one subject, because you are an expert in a number of subjects, but you mentioned the Georgia Guidestones, um, a subject that I do find absolutely fascinating. Do you mind describing the Georgia Guidestones? Because some people go, no, that can't be true. There, there weren't these stones that were explaining uh, what they're going to do and reduce the earth population and do this that, and the other. Could you give me an, an outline of the Georgia Guidestones? Absolutely. And I can provide the PowerPoint that includes what they were and what happened afterwards. That would that would be an entire program because uh, President Kennedy warned us April 27, 1961. And at the beginning of that, I have a complete summary of his paragraph. It will happen by infiltration, not invasion. And they've been infiltrating from the very, very beginning. Their documents don't say, you know, when when my family came, some of them from Norway, and from other areas of the world, when they came, my dad's family came from Norway, they had to go through Ellis Island. They had to sign all these documents. They had to prove that all their debts were paid in Norway. They had to prove who they were. They had to prove their occupation. Uh, there's so many Norwegian jokes about occupations coming into America. It's absolutely crazy. And that's what was required. These people have come in. They're from Germany. They're from Switzerland. There's no town. There's no province. There's no there's no indication for where they are or how they got here or who they're related to or who signed for them or who guaranteed that, that they were reliable. They, 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 they brought themselves in and from all the coastlines. People are worried about the southern border, but it's all of our borders. Right. The highest level of Muslim population is in Michigan and uh, Dearborn and Detroit, Michigan. How did that happen? And I said, God, what is this all about? At the time, this is back when I was writing the book about identity theft, $16 ferry ride from Canada into Michigan. They come in on visitor visas, never go home. They come in on student visas, never go to school and never go home. And then they bring all their families here on visit visitor visas and they never go home. And that's not, there's so much more than what's happening at the Southern border. But it's so, it's so powerful and they wanted to depopulate us. <laughs> and God would not send us if there wasn't enough room for us. He wouldn't send us if there wasn't enough water to take care of us. He wouldn't send us if there's not enough natural resources to provide for us. We have so much more than what they're willing to tell you. And every one of their environmental projects that they've been telling us about for the past how many decades, not one of them has come to pass. The planet didn't freeze, did it? I mean, all of these, they're just craziness. By this year, this is going to happen if you don't do these environmental changes. None of it has ever happened. It's all the tactics of the enemy, fear, doubt, and unbelief. That's why you had me write a devotional. It came out one block before, one 
or two weeks before the lockdowns. I had no idea. It was in a discussion for seven years with the father. And I said, Father, I don't know why you want me to do a devotional. People put this fluffy stuff out on social media and the next day they don't even remember what they put out there. I, it means nothing. It's not changing lives. And he said, we're going to change lives. So it doesn't have a day of the week, which is the other kingdom. They named Sun Day on the Venerable Day of the Son of their God. They named all these days. They named the months. It has nothing to do with the Hebrew Israelites and the basis of our background. And who we're grafted in with are the Hebrew Israelites. And so we don't understand Hebrew or our culture or our land or our language. We don't know because we've been split apart and departed from relationship with the Father. So the the... The devotional didn't have a title until the day that it was being released. They said, I can't release it, God, without a title. After seven years, we got it completed so quickly because he agreed. We just do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And on seven is Sabbath, the day to speak about blessings. And the other six days are man's days of countering the fear, doubt, and unbelief, the tactics of the enemy. And so it was so much more fun because he said he would make it more fun for me. And it was because there's nothing fluffy about it. Each day you look at how is the world influencing you? How are you going into fear, doubt, and unbelief? And then we even did rever reverential fear because what people don't understand, there's this joke all around the globe now that there's more than 365 fear not chapters in the, in the Bible. It's not true. There aren't even 365 verses. There are 145 on fear. And I said, now what am I going to do? And when he gave me 146, it had the priestly blessing to put on the seventh day. That's how much fun God it has with, with doing the research with him. And then as he had me add doubt and unbelief, we still didn't have 365. So then he said, you have to do reverential fear because my people don't understand in reverential fear, they're divinely protected. And so it was like a training manual for the people to come out of fear, doubt, and unbelief because you can laugh at them. And constantly the scriptures, and there were so many of them, I didn't even know what can they do to us. Mere mortals have no power over us. We're eternal. So I learned so much from this process. I knew it, but didn't really live it that way, didn't even express it that way. And it came out right before the lockdowns in 2020. Unbelievable. Did you see, just as a side question, did you see the the lockdowns coming? Was that a surprise to you as it was was to me? Did it was a see... surprise to all of us. I, I didn't know when, when that book came out. And the, the title, again, was only given to me uh, the day that it's releasing. I said, I got to title it something. And he called it a Warriors Battlefield Strategy Devotional. Countering the Tactics of the Enemy, Fear, Doubt, and Unbelief is a subtitle. Wow. So Georgia Guidestones, the stone slabs that are there no more, they were, what, blown up, what, a couple of years ago? On July 6th of 2022 Wow, is when it happened. And it happened at 4 a.m. because 4 means structure. So we obliterated their structure because it was like a power grid like um, electrical grid to all of these obelisks around the world because all of it had to do with the 14 parts of Osiris, the God. He was okay. cut into 14 parts, flung all throughout, and they couldn't find the critical uh, part that would help him procreate. And so that part, his mother fashioned, whether she did it out of paper mache or concrete, it doesn't matter. She said that she actually performed sex with it and had a baby and it's an immaculate conception is from the God. And so he became her baby, became another God. And, and it was all done to the fact that there was incest in the family. And it's the identical story to Nimrod's mother, Semiranus, where she had to move because he was killed. And then she said it was an immaculate conception and he was born on December 25. And all the sun gods became sun gods. Mortals became their gods who all died and never rose again. And those mortal gods all died and they were all born on December 25, except Dionysus. And since they put him over the vineyard, the winemaking, uh, he was that God. They moved his birthday to December 25, which is impossible to do. But all of their other gods, sun gods, were supposedly born on December 25. And they're all dead. And they try and resurrect them, re-erect re them, reincarnate them with four candles 
the Advent candles on Sundays, four Sundays before December 25. None of this has to do with us, but we're all operating in this in our churches. The song No El means no Elohim. There isn't a Native American chief that hasn't told me the same truth. And his name wasn't Noah, it was Nua, because there is no no with us as believers in the true Father. And we have more power in us by Christ being in our hearts, we have three-day resurrection power. And God proved to Prophet Nancy Haney, she had a stroke three days later after they had been yelling at her that you're going to have to just stay in the hospital for all these months minimum, and then you're going to have rehab for all these months. You can't eat on your own. You can't walk on your own. You can't speak. We have to bring you back through all of these things. You need to just be quiet, quit being upset, and she had to, a schedule. She came to Georgia and South Carolina every two times a year, January, February, July, August. So she couldn't come. And so she finally, she repented to the father and said, Father, I'm so sorry. I'm trying to meet my schedule. But if it's your will, as long as it takes for me to get my voice back, I'll wait. As long as it takes for me to, to do all these things, I'll wait. And boom, she was hit with two big paddles like like a, the blue cart and she goes up in the air and she goes, what was the heck? What, what the heck? And heard her voice out loud and she was shocked. And so she moved herself and she was able to get on the floor and she started dancing. She said, father, father, what has happened? And he said, three day, day resurrection power. And she's like on the third day, it's right. God, this is the third day and I have resurrection power. She's singing. She's dancing. All those people who were yelling at her moments before came back in the hotel room, said or the hospital room said, what is going on with you? And she said, third day resurrection power. I'm not going to need any rehab. Call my husband. He has to come and pick me up. God told her to go to Niagara Falls. Reason being when she got there, he said, Nancy, tell me what you see. And she said, well, I see a lot of water. God, There's a lot of water in Niagara Falls. He goes, no, Nancy, tell me what you see. And he, she said, well, there's, I think, a river, and then it flows over the falls. And then I think it forms another river, but I can only see what I can see from here, God. And God said, no, Nancy, you see. And then he said it very deeply through her power. And she's like, yes, God, there's a lot of power. It's, it's, it's a loud noise. I don't know if you've ever been to Niagara Falls, but it's huge noise, constant noise, because it, it, the power that goes over it. So when I went to put it in a book to identify this, God said, don't just tell the people is it has a lot of power. And I said, but God, it does. It has third day resurrection power. You said that. He said more than the power in Niagara Falls. And my people won't understand it unless you tell them how much power that is. And I'm like, well, how am I going to know how much power is in Niagara Falls? He made me research it. And on the U.S. side alone, on America's side, not the Canadian side, on America's side alone, it takes care of 3.8 million homes. He said, now, Sheila, put that in the book and tell my people they're not even tapping into it. Ni Niagara, um, I haven't actually been there, but of course, I've been near there. But of course, you know, you, you see footage of it you see people go in there you fully appreciate the the power of it but but you've said a very important thing which is when populations are relying on that relying on rivers relying on all these natural resources um that's why with what happened in uh, east palestine um a year i think a year ago um was uh, extremely alarming what was even more alarming is how you then make a film um, about a train crash the year before or is shown for Netflix. And, and then people wonder when we say, well, oh, my goodness, this seems to have been flagged in advance. And then mm. here, here it is. Why, Sheila, on that note, why, why is there such a disconnect for people? There is such a disconnect when you explain the facts, you put things in front of them and they still will not look at it. I mean, the I know we come back to the Georgia Guidestones. That's another thing where some people say, oh, what, they really exist? Yes, they were in Georgia. They were in Georgia. Why is there a disconnect in, in regard to belief? It's done through the programming. Uh, Georgia Guidestones, in comparison to the Faith Monument, are in almost every single one of my books. I really got deep on the Georgia Guidestones in the book series, which there's five, there's going to be seven. Um, 
but I have four books to get out. And the one that has to get out is going to enhance six and seven and second edition nation restoration. And that's because what's happening is happening without us being aware why we merged with the other kingdom. There's only two kingdoms. There's a living Lord and breath of life. This is as simple as I can make it. The other kingdom is all about death. The 20 year of a pandemic, every century, I've gone back to the 1300s. I can't go back before that because it wasn't much written anywhere. And uh, so I haven't been able to get back below 1320. But from 1320 forward, there's been a pandemic in every 20 year in every century. Why? 20 to them means recycle unto death. Everything about them is death because they're going to reincarnate it. And that's why when their people die, they keep saying, you'll find out the secret. You'll find out the secret. You'll be back as something else. And that's not, there's no truth of that. There's no evidence of that. There's no involvement in that. Uh, when they're gone, they're gone. And you're either going where the living kingdom ends up in heaven or you're going to hell. And there's only two options. There's only two kingdoms. It was made clear to me. Um, and then we do need to come. I'll keep coming back to the Georgia Guidestones. But I was in a, a very beautiful resort and I had spoken and and everybody does rah, rah around me. And they're really excited to hear the information, but nothing changes. And I keep thinking I'm not giving them enough information. I'm not giving them the deep enough information. I, I don't know what you want me to do. And uh, it's the same thing with the books. I keep putting all this stuff in the books and I, I want to make sure it has value before it goes out. And then people tell me, I've got to read these books four and five times because there's gems all over the place. And, and then I have to, you know, chew on them again. And then I have to reread it again. They said, this is really deep stuff. And to me, I just wanted to make sure everybody got value. That's, that's what goes on. So I said, father, I don't know what to do. And he said, let's, let's go sit by the windows. And so I was in the restaurant and I sat down and he said, do you have a salt and sh pepper shaker? And I said, yes, father. And he said, this will help you. You want it to be simple? I said, that's my request. I want it to be simple. So when I say it, people will understand you're either in his kingdom or you're not. The thing you do not want him to say is, I never knew you. Um, you did some interesting things. It's all in scripture. All these works that you did, they were interesting, but you did not do it through the power of Christ. You did not do it through your salvation. You were doing it. And a lot of pastors still ask me, do you think I've done enough, done enough to go to heaven? Pastors are asking that. People in the churches who are or leaders in the churches are asking that. Ministry people ask that. They don't have the relationship. So what we're missing is they departed us from the relationship. And that's what the pilgrims knew. If you keep doing this church structure, you will never know the father because they'll never talk about the father. And he's your provider and supplier. So you make Christ wrong for that. And they say, you have to come through, you have to come through me. And that is a scripture when you ask in my name. But what it means is you don't go through the medium channeler because that's against scripture. You don't do that. You don't go to Christ to ask him to ask father. We become joint heirs. What does that mean? You put your arms elbow to elbow in Lincoln with each other. We're joint heirs with Christ when we're, we're saved and we become grafted in. And that's with the Hebrew Israelites who have direct relationship with the father. And in Hebrew, father, son, Holy Spirit are one. It was never divided because they are one. They operate as one. The guide of the Holy Spirit is the guide for Christ and the Father. The reason why I say Christ, there's no power in Jesus. So that's how simple it is. So anyway, I went in the, in the restaurant and I sat down. I took the salt in my right hand and I took the pepper in my left, which was his request. And he said, do you think you're the salt of the earth? And I said, I pray that I am. And I just reread this morning about you better be of good flavor. And so I hope I'm of good flavor, but only you would be able to tell me that. And he said, do you want to do what I want you to do? And I said, yes, Father. And he said, do you want to align with my will, which is in the Lord's Prayer that Christ taught us? This is how to be in relationship with the Father. Hallowed be his name. His kingdom come. His will be done. We don't even connect with that. The little primers, the New England primers that were developed by the pilgrims, that's the prayer of the children every day and every night. The two children's prayers are, are on one little page. That thing is so small. I'll just show you. I've got a copy right here. David Barton revised it. 
and uh, they they were six dollars. Now they're seven ninety nine through ChristianBook.com, and uh, and it's powerful. They talk about the martyrs and everything, but here's how simple it is. Father, as I go in to rest with you at night, when our new day begins, because our day begins at sundown, when I go in to rest with you, oh, Father, remind me, was there anywhere today that I was not aligned with your will? For I want to be aligned with your will and be with you always. In the morning, they got up and said, Father, I thank you for aligning with me with you on this day, operating in your will on this day. And that's as simple as I can say those prayers. So, Father, I said, yes. I, I really pray that I am. He goes, great. Then you are in my kingdom. I said, yes, Father, thank you. Um, I thought so, but thank you. You know, I mean, and there was nothing else. I said, Father, what else? He said, Sheila, everything else is not. Man's plans never stand. Only God's plans stand. The thoughts of man are what cause their problems. Yeah. The structures of man which include what they call Christianity in its, in its blasphemous. They even put the name on it. Christ didn't do it when he was here. So you put his name on it and you call it that. And then they keep dividing you and having moms come together. Women come together on Monday or Tuesday night. And then they got the men coming together Wednesday or Thursday night. Then they got the youth coming in on Friday night. Why not keep the family together instead of having them separated all during the week? I, the stuff that they're division, 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 and they know this to be true. They know these lies. They're taught in a seminary that these are all lies, just like the pilgrims knew once they had a translation of the Bible in 1535 with Tyndale. And as soon as they were training him, uh, there's a wonderful DVD on Tyndale, God's Outlaw. And in that, the very first scene, the children, they're asking him, do you know anything of the Bible? And the children start saying the Lord's Prayer. And people keep wondering, well, Sheila, how do you pray like you pray? You study learning the Lord's Prayer. That's how Christ taught us to pray. Because once we hallow his name and, and do these things, because the children started to say the Lord's Prayer in English, they said, okay, uh, find the Father. He has to be boiled in oil. It's no different than Constantine that um, you people feel that you represent the light of the world. You think Christ is in you? Do you think that you know who he is, well, great, you can light up for us. And so they would burn them on stakes at night for light on the street. If you don't want to be yeah. burned up at night, then come join our fellowship on the venerable day of the sun. And all shops have to be closed. Nobody can work on the venerable day of the sun. And that's why it's called Sun Day. Yeah. It's not S-O-N, our son of our father. It's S-U-N. And we have been confused from the very, very beginning and the pilgrims knew the truth. They brought the truth here. They knew the Native Americans knew the truth. And when Europe found out that all of this was happening, they had to come here and take over. Sheila, how how we arrived, arrived at a point where you're having a discussion with a pastor who's asking you if, they, if they've if they done enough good works. I mean, we don't have a, a good work. That isn't how our faith uh, our faith evolves. How, how have we arrived at, at this point? Are we saying that they're, they're hirelings? They just see it as a job. It is uh, for a certain income. And um, even there's a place in Atlanta, Georgia, that has been wanting people to come and speak, but it's totally controlled um, by 33rd degree Masons. And the pastor still wanted the person to come. Good friend of mine, powerful woman of God. And she said, can't do it. And the pastor said, why? And he said, she said, go ask your leadership. He went to the leadership, called her back the next day. He, he said he didn't know they were all 33rd degree Masons. But if they were all 33rd degree Masons, the requirement is if you want to be a Mason in this town, a uh, pastor in this town, you got to be a Mason. If you want to be a banker in this town, it's been from the very territorial government structures in America. We were taken over way before we became states. Way, I mean, way before we thought we had independence. We were still fighting the battle in 1781. In 1812, in, in high school band, I was playing the 1812 overture in band. And, we, and it was a powerful song. We didn't know. 1812, we were still fighting Britain in America to say it was our land, not your land. I mean, we don't, <laughs> we just don't know the truth. But it's so powerful how how you're following in this whole line, um, Mark, because a lot of people don't even want to know this, don't want to talk about it. But the pastors were told in seminary not to reveal any of this. And what I think is happening is the conflict. 
Because when that pastor was asked, now that you know that they're all 33rd degree Masons, what are you going to do? He said, my wife and I just moved here. We need this income. But it's not just the control. They, they control the seminaries. The seminaries have been making sure that you don't bring the Holy Spirit in. You don't allow it in the churches. The church structure in scripture is the apostle and prophet called by God, not a title people were given by the International Coalition of Apostles that now call themselves the International Coalition of Apostolic Leaders because now their prayer coordinators are apostles. They all have to pay dues. They all have to pay for an email every month, a newsletter. They have to pay 450 for their dues, 150. Well, this is what it was when they asked me to become part of it. See, Peter Wagner, John P. Kelly set this up back in 1999. In July, they asked me to participate. And I had been doing emails on a laptop that was left in Australia when the pastor that I was sent to encourage by these guys, um, I ended up three days after meeting him going to Australia. And God covered that ticket. And this has been my whole life since way back in the 90s. And it's for about 30 years now. And so when that happened, he left the laptop with me. And they said, what you're writing, we want you to do a newsletter. And I said, for what? And he goes, we're going to do the mega church pastors. We're going to commission them as apostles. I said, for what? I said, only God calls the prophets and apostles, pastors, evangelists, teachers. It's God's call on the fivefold ministry. And he said, no, no, no. He said, um, and most of these guys were already made prophets. Remember in the 90s where the pastors became prophets? Well, this was the end of the 90s when they were they were starting to commission them as apostles. So even Bill Heyman, I think his name was, who did the uh, School for the Prophets. If you look at his title, he was Bill Heyman. I don't know what he was before the name pastor, but he's got pastor, bishop, prophet, apostle on it. And then I think it's apostle overseer or whatever. But all these different titles, they were excited to have them. And so what happened is I said, no, I can't, sir, I can't do that. He said, Sheila, you got nothing. You got no money. And I said, well, God, God hasn't left me on the side of the road. And he said, the 150 from them, and we have a thousand pastors, you're not putting it together. You'd end up with a third of this. We're going to share everything equally with you. And each of us are going to get $50 for that newsletter every month. And so that, that's going to give you 50,000 a month. That's going to change your life. And I said, but you can't commission apostles. And he said, yes, we are. We're going to be there covering. And so their dues are going to be $450. And if their spouses want to come in, we'll bring them in for $300. And so that split was 150 each. So that's 150,000 a month. And then the, the spouses for 300 is another hundred a month. That's another hundred thousand a month. You see how this works. And he, and I said, you want to start a club of apostles. It makes no sense. It really doesn't make any sense. And it's not God. I I was just in all these different nations. God introduced me before I arrived. God told me who needed the help. God directed everything. And God got me in safe. He got me out safe. He provided everything while I was there. I had nothing to go. And I had nothing while I was there. And as much as I was blessed, I came home with nothing to and accept the same assignment in the next assignment without an extra coin or tunic. He's doing according to scripture. You can't do this. And then he said, well, Sheila, it's going to be even better. I said, better than what? And he said, they're going to be tithing to us. And these churches have over 20,000 members to become a mega church. Can you imagine a thousand churches with over 20,000 members tithing to us? I said, they can't tithe to us. He said, what do you mean? And it came out of my mouth, filthy lucre. That's filthy lucre. And I didn't know the meaning of lucre. Didn't know it was in scripture because that's how God works through me. He said, I'm walking with you as I walked with them. And all they want to do is hear about them and repeat them. And I'm, they're not walking with me. And because I kept saying, I'm not a Bible scholar. I can't represent you. They, they say that I have to go out in twos and you're only sending one. I said, he said, did I ever send you two tickets or just one? I said, you sent one ticket. He said, am I wrong? Did I not send witnesses to everything I did through you? I said, yes, there were witnesses to everything you did. So he's giving me the definition of these are people who don't know me. These are people who are not operating with me. And when I turned that down, I was supposed to be blessed more than the rental car. It was up north of Santa Rosa that's way up above San Francisco. It's inland. I would have needed, you know, three or three stops at a gas station to get back to San Diego. God filled my tank because that man left without giving me the blessing. 
when I went to take him to the airport, he was gone in the morning. And I never have, to this day, that was July of 1999, never really received the blessing. And they went on their website and said in September of 99, they went to Singapore and it was demanded to them. Singapore is not even as big as Manhattan. And Singapore mega church is Joseph Prince. And he demanded it of them that they do this. It was something that they'd already planned, something they'd already put in motion, something they already had the thousand list of pastors to do it with. And then all of a sudden, Joseph Prince is here with Joel Olstein and T.D. Jakes, and he's on TBN, and he's with all these pastors. I didn't expose any of this until they went after Mark Taylor in February of 21. And when I did this, it was in March of 21, when I put all the facts together, provided everything to them, everybody could do their own research. Then in April 21, they did an... Um, prophetic standard statement. And all you needed to do was click and sign. You didn't even need to see it, but God had me look at it and there were no authors. And then in May, he told me where to look and it go right back to the international coalition. Now of apostolic leaders, charisma magazine, uh, person in charge managing it. He's an apostle. His reporters are apostles who write the articles. All of these people are in the club. And so they've changed absolutely everything. In the article against Mark Taylor, they said, uh, we are the 32 in tasked with quality control of the body of Christ. And then they list part of them. The rest of them are all listed on the International Coalition of Apostolic Leaders, ICAL. And then every meeting I went to, people were coming up, district superintendents or apostles, uh, all these, and you can only be a, a horizontal apostle or a vertical apostle if you're only a mega church pastor. You don't get to become a horizontal. I'm not kidding. They use these names, horizontal apostle, when you bring more churches under you. And so it's so then all of them we get commissioned to be an apostle, <laughs> and then all of those churches then start their horizontal layers. You see how this works, and they've been doing this since 1999. When I called him in 2013 and I said, now I'm in Georgia and God is showing me you're ruining the body. You're completely ruining the body and we got to do something about this. So what did they do? They convened together in October of 2013 when I was in Georgia for less than a month and made the phone call. They, they convened together and they have a statement on there that they stopped being the, um, the covering for these people. Didn't quit charging the dues. Didn't requ stop requiring four summits a year. And this isn't just American. This is global. These are pastors all over the world. And um, and it's not just pastors now. And it's not just making pastors and prophets now with an apostle title. All of it is man's plan. And man's plans always fail. Only God's plans succeed. So that's why nothing was done about the Georgia Guidestones. That's why nobody even wanted to hear about it. I've been preaching on this for how many years now? And that's that has caused me to become known. And I still have the title. And, and I said, but they're down, they're down as the Georgia Guidestones gal. Can you imagine? That's that's what every all this research, uh, 18 books are out, four are coming out soon. Uh, book six and seven, Nation Restoration, second edition. And I'm finally doing a full training manual on the 45 points of how they destroy us before we're self-governing. So now when we rebuild our nations and come back to the truth and operate as one nation under God, we're going to know what to do because we're, I'm going to, it all, those 45 points show you exactly what they've done to compromise us with absolutely everything in the other kingdom without even realizing we were doing it. And, and so now this is a long answer to what you were asking. How did we get here? Step by step by step. What they do is take you to the edge on how people dress. And then as soon as you quit complaining about it, then they ease up a bit, but then they go even further in their next push. And they do the same thing with movies. They do the same thing with art. They do the same thing. And then they create this whole psychiatric structure in Amer in uh, the world. And then when you want to speak the truth and that counters what their plan is, they send you for a psych evaluation. Then they have to eliminate you. And if you won't shut up, they put you in asylum so you won't be heard of there. And then when they close the asylums, the only option was to eliminate you from the earth. And so it just it doesn't change. The children who want to speak up in school, give them Ritalin, make them drug addicts the rest of their life. Then you steal their children. 
You put them into sex trafficking. The, all the layers that we're going through, everything we're experiencing, all of this, the pilgrims knew before they came to America. And they came from England and it was the third try. Uh, things were stolen from them. Their money was stolen from them. They were stopped all three times. And the Georgia Guidestones, now this is how they counter the faith monument that has the four pillars and how to raise up a child is on above Pilgrim Rock that became Plymouth Rock. Above Pil and it was in Pilgrim Colony that became Plym Plymouth Colony. The governor, William Bradford, said of all of these things, this all comes to us from God, all of these blessings. His statement on there, and I'll send you the PowerPoint so that you have it, Mark. He, they stated exactly God gave us everything. And it is due to his blessings we even made it on the third time. And they were just below in Cape Cod that right now is not even a 25-minute drive to get up to Plymouth where the faith monument is. His wife fell overboard and died. And he got that far, but his wife didn't make it to Plymouth. But those four pillars are morality, with your eyes closed and Christ in your heart. Know what you say and know how you decide. Because every choice takes you on the path of where you're headed. And where you end up is based on all those choices and decisions. And so that's why you start with morality. The next is law. Law, you get some peers together the very day it happens. And the two involved parties sit down from each other. And the peers from the community that you stay tight with, because you're living with them and surviving with them, they hear the two sides and determine what has actually happened based on the truth. And it's all based on true justice, on pre-existing law. And you'll find this from any constitutional attorney. Our laws were based on pre-existing law, which is God's law that's defined in how you handle things in the Bible and in the Ten Commandments. And that's why the president of America took his guys out and walked behind to the church that they tried to blow up when the BLM Antifa riots were going on. And he held up the Bible and said, this is our law. And he made it very, very clear because America has become what all other nations have become. Opinion law, human law, positive law is what it's called, case law. So you take opinions of judges, opinions of cases, you throw it all together, mix it together, and you don't have any truth. So you don't have justice. So there is no mercy. The law pillar on the faith monument is justice and mercy in equal measure. The third one is education. The mother is holding the Ten Commandments. She's got the Bible scrolls in her other hand. On the side panels are the grandparents teaching them about the world and the Bible. That's education. They started forcing compulsory attendance of public schools so they could control the future generations. Then you come around and where are you at? You're at liberty. And the man Liberty is sitting on the skinned and um, I use this skinned bear or uh, lion of England. You know, the lion that, that stands up, it's the Rothschild yep. lion. Yep. It's the Rockefeller lion. That same lion is over England. And that's why it's on the wraps on the coffins. Diana, Philip, the queen, all of these people who've died, you see that emblem on top of that. And so that's the lion and it's skinned. He is sitting on the head of the lion. His foot is on the word tyranny, his right foot. He's holding a looking glass to look out over the horizon and make sure tyranny does not come onto this land. And it was already here before we even inaugurated the first president. And um, the limp our uh, paw of the lion is up over his right shoulder on that monument. And at the top is faith pointing to heaven, holding the Bible. We have to operate in faith because if you start worrying about this stuff and what are they going to do and what's going to happen to the currency and da, 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 you yeah. don't have faith and you're not trusting the Lord overall. So that's how you counter. Now here's the Georgia Guidestones. It's only 19 feet tall. And it, you, you look it up. Look up Georgia Guidestones, and it will say America Stonehenge. It wasn't built by some people who moved these stones in, in, in a, from another land. It's nothing to do with the Stonehenge. It is only 19 feet tall granite monument. It is declared to be the tallest in America. The Faith Monument was put up in 1989, erected in 1889. 
on the 100 year of our nation, 1789 inauguration of President Washington, 1889, that monument was finally up in 1889. In 1980 on 322, so you can go to Genesis 322, this is the root of the Luciferian plan. When God said, now that they know good from evil, let's say eat of the tree in life and live forever. That was his hope. There's a long pause, say law. And Adam left the garden, was ashamed and left the garden because of what had happened. And Lucifer and the, the whole Satan structure, all of their gods, goddesses, everything, have been using that lie from the, from the very beginning in the garden. These people are cursed on the land. They don't belong here. We have to get rid of them. This is our land. And so that's what we're dealing with. It's all depicted on the Georgia Guidestones. It's four pillars, eight languages. And what, what are the coincident facts? I mean, total coincidence that the eight languages that are modern languages on the four big pillars and the four ancient languages around the capstone all match these nations. BRICS, Russia, India, China. They formed it in 2008 and said they were done. They lied. They said that South Africa fought for four years or two more years to get to be part of it. So in 2008, it was four nations. The fifth one was added in 2010, and it all matches the languages of the Georgia Guidestones. So what are the chances that a whole other currency structure would be developed and now they're adding the nations. Which nations are they adding? The nations that Noah's sons, grandsons, and great-grandsons went to to take over. So if you'll agree to keep being controlled by us, then we'll let you be part of this currency. Is that what's going okay. on? Okay. It's very clear as the messages. And the depopulation is the I'm first. Sorry to yeah. interrupt. I'm just saying we've got about three, three minutes. Okay. Um, and you, well, your knowledge is your knowledge is incredible. I'm fascinated by what you're saying about the seminaries and as we started discussing the Georgia Guidestones, just to say a discussion that I, I had here recently where someone got very upset with me is this whole thing of Genesis 6 about the fallen angels come down to earth and have sex with human women. And over here, we don't we don't teach that. We don't go into that. They call it the, you know, the sons of Seth and all, all this kind of thing. They're not taking it literally which it is um and it's a bit like well if you're not taking the jet the book of genesis literally and you're not taking the book of revelations literally and you're not taking that literally then you might as well throw the whole thing out with the baby with the bath water and just interpret whatever you want well and that's exactly the plan mm. that is exactly the plan and this is the answer you get the pastors, when you when you get to really get personal with them and find out why are you doing this? Why yeah. are you gathering people on Sunday? Why are you putting two or three Christmas trees up in the churches and, and right in front of the people that they come in? And why are you doing the Advent candles? If you knew this truth and they said that they're told, every one of them had the same answer. We were told not to ruin the traditions and the, the memories of the families based upon these celebrations. I said, you're not calling them feasts and festivals, but they're pagan, Gentile, occultish, spiritualism celebrations, and they're called feasts and festivals, but we're not using those names. Constantine and the Nicene Council did this to us, and he died 12 years later, and Rome fell 70 years later. So why are you doing this? We're not going to ruin the traditions and the memories for the families. That's the answer. How sad wow. is that? Sheila, where can people find you? Where can they find you? Where can they reach out to you? Hisbest.org. And all of your books, as I will have them in the description, all of your books, are, they're available through Amazon, aren't they? And they can get them through your website, yes? Yes. And they're printed in Australia and 
Italy and European Union and Germany and um, Deutschland even, you know, did some with us. I don't know all these nations because they just have initials behind it. And those are all printed uh, through Amazon locations, even Canada. You can order them direct. Uh, you don't, and your local bookstores should have them because we've made them available for print. So you don't have to just get an electronic version. Everybody that had a Nook lost thousands of books. And so we're, we're making sure we provide everything and it's in eBooks and it's in Kindle and it's in Barnes and Noble here. I don't know all your bookstores there, but it, it's easily available and you can get the printed books also. Brilliant. Brilliant. Sheila, I want to thank you so much. I'm sorry I'm sort of cutting us off bit under the hour, but it's it's uh, makes life a little bit easier. But I just want to thank you very much for joining me on my own little podcast, which I'm trying to grow. And I just say to people, subscribe, like, share. And um, I'm sure that Sheila will give me the privilege of coming back when we can when we can do that in her busy schedule. And Sheila, thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to play us out. But um, thank you for joining me today. Well, and thank you. My grandmother was direct from England, Hunstanton in Lincolnshire and uh, Sussex, part of her life and uh, know, did a I job know. in Hull. So so grandpa met her in World War One and then she came to Canada. They married there to come into America as a war bride. I know part so, of that world very well. All right, my friend. Thank you very much indeed. Don't go away. I'll say goodbye off camera. All right. Take care. Thank you.